This video is going to focus on the history of the European wild man myth. Whilst the wild man of the woods idea is associated with Europe, as we shall see, this concept is something that goes back much further than the medieval art and stories. The tradition goes to the root of man's removal from or conquest over nature and is seen the world over. The wild man of the wood, or wood woes, is a truly ancient archetype dating back to the very earliest civilizations and potentially imported to Europe from earlier folkloric traditions. Indeed, one of the earliest examples is that of Enkidu in the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh, thought to be the earliest surviving great work of literature, records the exploits of the eponymous King of Uruk and dates from around 2100 BC. It features heavy animalistic references and a character, Enkidu, has been portrayed as being horned, possibly as the Mesopotamian bull man. Enkidu also embodies one of the earliest wild man stories. A description of him read, His body was rough, he had long hair like a woman's, it waved like the hair of Nisaba, the goddess of corn. His body was covered with matted hair like Samogans, the god of cattle. He was innocent of mankind, he knew nothing of the cultivated land. Enkidu ate grass in the hills with the gazelle and lurked with the beasts at the waterholes. He had joy of the water with the herds of wild game. The connection with the goddess of corn, obviously an overt, if passing, reference to both early agriculture and to the harvest and fertility, cannot be overlooked. This is especially the case when one considers the role of horned deities in the centuries following the Epic of Gilgamesh, but more on that later. The story tells of Enkidu's civilization after a trapper encountered him. He used a naked harlot from the Temple of Love to tempt Enkidu by having her woman's power turn him from the beasts to the world of humanity. The scheme went that after Enkidu had had sex with the woman, the animals would reject him. This turned out to be the case, and Enkidu ended up challenging Gilgamesh for dominance in Uruk, but was defeated and the pair became friends. The hero Gilgamesh was himself described flatteringly as being bull-like. When the gods created Gilgamesh, they gave him the perfect body. Shamash, the glorious sun, endowed him with beauty. Adad, the god of the storm, endowed him with courage. The great gods made his beauty perfect, surpassing all others, terrifying like a great wild bull. Two-thirds they made him god and one-third man. As I mentioned in my previous video about the so-called Beast of Bodmin Moor and its folkloric context, the Norse had a warrior class known as Berserkers, who were sometimes referred to as Ulf Helfnar, or Wolf-skinned. Warriors donned animal pelts, used mind-altering drugs and danced themselves into frenzy to imbue them with the natural ferocity of wolves or bears. And the wolf aspect goes even further back to the Proto-Indo-European Koryos. These were male war bands which consisted of allegedly shape-shifting warriors wearing animal skins to assume the nature of wolves or dogs. But the horned motif for anthropomorphism goes back further still than the canine or ursine aspect. The Trois Frères Cave in Ariège, France, features what could be the earliest depiction of a god, dating from as far back as the Paleolithic. The figure, dubbed the Sorcerer, was found in a cave known as the Sanctuary. It was determined to have been made in around 13,000 BC. In the 1920s, Catholic priest Omri Brule sketched the figure, which was a horned humanoid creature standing upright on two legs. The Sorcerer has been interpreted as a master of animals or spirit of nature. Its presence in the cave gave rise to theories that ritual magic ceremonies took place there in what would have been one of the earliest demonstrations of religious devotion. On seeing the sketch, the folklorist and anthropologist Margaret Murray said it represented the first depiction of a deity on earth. It was further claimed that the figure revealed shamanistic practices were taking place among incredibly ancient people. It is worth noting that similar forms of shamanism took place among both the ancient inhabitants of Siberia and Native Americans, who were thought to have originated in the region before crossing into North America via the then ice-bound Bering Strait. In fact, it has been demonstrated in recent years that Native Americans, Siberians and even Northern Europeans all share common ancestry in the people classified as ancient North Eurasians. Did the migrating people who would settle across North America take some of their religion with them? Horned headdresses were certainly often seen in some Native American rituals. This brings us to another ancient incident of horned headgear, this time from modern-day North Yorkshire in England. The Mesolithic site known as Star Car yielded incredible finds after the site's discovery in 1947. Chief among these were Britain's oldest structure and 21 red deer stag skullcaps, 
that are almost certain to have been worn as headdresses. Opinion is divided over what function these headdresses served, with some suggesting they may have been used by hunter-gatherers as aids for blending in and stalking deer as prey, although others favour the explanation that they were used for ritual purposes, which would be an intriguing prospect. In the classical period, the wild man legend can be seen in the satyr or fawn of Greek and Roman mythology, the ancient Greek Dionysus or Bacchus as he was known to the Romans, the goat man god Pan and the Roman woodland deity Sylvanus. In the Bronze Age, according to frescoes, the ancient Minoans of Crete had a sporting or ritual practice where they leapt over bulls. This could be seen as a taming of the wild or the conquest of nature by civilization, but it is also an example of the way in which bulls were worshipped. This was also the case with the Phoenicians and their satellite civilizations, such as the Carthaginians, whose sometimes horned vegetation deity, Baal Hamon, was a fertility god. The bull-headed Moloch was another Canaanite god who apparently had an insatiable appetite for child sacrifice. This is echoed in the story of King Minos and the Minotaur, where civilised people were sent to their deaths at the hands of the bestial bull-man Minotaur as a kind of payment to nature. It is no accident that the story sees the Athenian hero and founder King Theseus finally slaying the beast as a triumph of the preeminent civilization of the day, Athens, ending Cretan bondage, but also winning against the wild and untamed nature itself. Bulls were also revered in Mycenaean Greece, Troy and across the eastern Mediterranean and Bronze Age helmets were routinely decorated with horns including depictions of the mysterious sea peoples who were blamed by many for instigating the Bronze Age collapse. Ancient Egypt was no different with the deity Amun being depicted as horned alongside other gods with such appendages and vegetal fertility deities were also in evidence, with the Roman cult of Mithras including the Egyptian god Serapis and its devotions. Alexander the Great, who became pharaoh of Egypt, was also mythologically claimed to have had horns. More recent Slavic and Alpine folklore features primarily winter creatures such as Krampus, who were represented as goat-like, and the Hungarian Busa Yaras tradition sees menfolk dressing up in hairy horned costumes as part of a commemoration of their victory over the Ottoman Turks, although it is thought the festival has a far older pagan root. Turning to the British Isles, the mythical figure of Myrdin, or Merlin, who was associated with the King Arthur legend, was also described as a wild man. The Vita Merlini, or Life of Merlin, strongly thought to have been penned by Geoffrey of Monmouth in around 1150, details how this occurred. Firstly, it is important to note the albeit approximate year of publication, 1150. This is a long time after the figure of Merlin was said to have existed, with earlier attestations placing his lifetime at around the 6th century. Therefore, it should not be viewed as a reliable historical account, but as a useful allegorical device in understanding, among other things, the phenomenon of the wild man. As an aside, it is also worth noting that Myrdin has been compared to the Irish Sethni and Scottish Lelaken, who had similar tales told about them. This alludes to them being either regional variations of an older archetype or retellings of the same story by different peoples. The figure of Merlin can be seen as being based on Myrdin Wilt or Myrdin the Wild. Pre-12th century Welsh poems portrayed Myrdin as a madman who dwelt in the Caledonian forest. His hermit-like existence in the wilderness was as a result of what we might now call post-traumatic stress disorder, where he struggled to come to terms with a brutal battle. This conflict has been suggested to have been the Battle of Afterith, where the king of Alt Clut, otherwise known as Strathclyde, inflicted a crushing defeat on the forces of Gwen Tholau. Myrthim was said to have been driven mad after witnessing the slaughter which, according to the Annals of Wales, took place in the year 573 AD. So, turning to the Vita Merlini, we can see this tale repeated. Merlin, or Merlinus as he is rendered in Latin, is described as something of a prophet. This tallies with the suggestions of some authors who have said that he may have been a druid. The idea of him being a bard is, according to some, a euphemistic allusion to his knowledge of oral history and ritual, allegedly consistent with pagan druidic practices. The Vita Merlini tells how Merlin was involved in a battle alongside Peridor, the king of Gwyneth, and Riddoc, the king of the Cumbrians, in conflict with Gwentholo, a Scottish king. Merlin's side is victorious, but the battle takes a heavy mental toll on him, as three brothers of Peridor die in the fighting. Merlin, consumed by grief, goes mad and flees to the Caledonian forest, where he subsists on grass and fruit. Merlin's sister, Gwenthith, wife of Riddock, learns of his whereabouts and sends someone to find him in the woods. 
He is then discovered lamenting the harshness of winter. The emissary sings a song to soothe Merlin, and he agrees to return to civilization in Riddick's royal court, but he reacts badly to the crowds after his self-imposed exile and suffers another mental breakdown. Merlin returns to the woods where he is described as riding a stag, talking of King Arthur and issuing prophecies. Ultimately, Merlin and Gwenthith end up together in the woods after turning their backs on the secular world. Merlin is further anchored as a being of nature rather than civilization, as he is traditionally described as being born of a mortal woman but sired by an incubus. An incubus is the male version of a succubus, which have been represented as animalistic demonic entities, often with reptilian or bird-like feet. It is from this creature that he was said to have inherited his magical powers, including prophecy and shape-shifting. Remaining in Britain, another of the groups of inhabitants contemporary with Merlin's alleged existence must be briefly examined. The Picts of what is now northeastern Scotland were a mysterious insular Celtic Brythonic people who raided their neighbours, especially in the decades after the Romans left Britain in around 410 AD. Other than their martial nature and construction of monumental standing stones, we know of their intricate art in carvings and in descriptions of their tattoos. These regularly featured animals with a focus on snakes, however they also appear to have revered the strength of bulls, their closeness to nature seemingly being a common feature among all insular Celts. In early British Christianity, the taming of nature and of horned beasts was a recurring feature. This can be seen as an allegorical bringing to heel of older Druidic beliefs. One such example appears in the miracle attributed to the Strathclyde-based St Kentigern, known as Mungo, 518-614 AD, who, without oxen to plough his fields, was able to command wild stags to take the yoke and do the job for him. This mastery of the wild by an adherent of Jesus Christ can be read as both a miracle of the incoming faith and a conquest of nature and the people of the stag as the folk of this area which encompasses modern-day Glasgow and Scotland's western coast were known. Further back in British history, to around 2250 BC, deer were associated with fertility in the particular case of the Dagenham Idol. The idol is thought to represent a mysterious nude god, with a hole for a phallic peg which is now left unfilled. The 18-inch Scots Pine Idol was found in marshland on the north bank of the River Thames to the east of London in Dagenham in 1922. It was buried in a layer of peat just under 10 feet below ground level near the skeleton of a deer. It is thought it was buried with the deer as part of a votive fertility sacrifice. Turning to mainland Europe, one of the leading Celtic deities across the centre and north of the continent was Kernunos. The god is often portrayed as being horned and is believed to be the antlered figure on the Gundestrup cauldron, thought to date from 200 to 300 BC. It was discovered in pieces with other parts stacked inside the base in 1891 in the small Danish settlement of Gundestrup. On the inner part of the cauldron, the god figure is shown with a torque in one hand and a horned serpent in the other, and appears as a kind of master of nature. The mythology is somewhat scant, but he is believed to have been a nature god and is associated with fertility. Kernanos has come to be associated with the notion of the horned god and the green man, and is a significant feature of modern neo-paganism and Wiccan beliefs. In the medieval period, or at least set in the Middle Ages, there were several examples of horned god facsimiles, wild men or legends or forest-dwelling spirits or men. These include Hearn the Hunter, the Green Man, the Green Knight, the Wild Hunt, the mythology of Odin, the literary character Grendel, Robin Hood and Herowood the Wake. Hearn the Hunter was a legendary anthropomorphised deer-headed apparition that haunted Windsor Great Park and Forest. The ghostly figure, who had antlers on his head, was said to ride a horse across the park and forest, rattling chains and terrifying cattle. He was also associated with the mythological and folkloric phenomenon of the Wild Hunt. The concept of the Wild Hunt, a ghostly host streaming across the night sky, has ancient roots. Whilst it is popularised in Northern European folklore, particularly in the Norse, Anglo-Saxon and Germanic traditions, it has representations in other belief systems, particularly those of an Indo-European root. Its echoes can be seen in Vedic beliefs from India and even in Abrahamic faiths. The story of Santa Claus and his flying reindeer-drawn sleigh could even owe its origin to the legend. The leader of the Wild Hunt has changed over the centuries, with Hearn the Hunter and the Norse god Odin being described as the head huntsman. 
The terrifying procession can be seen as a representation of the souls of the dead rampaging across the sky and visible to the living. As such, it has connections with the Celtic festival of Sarwin and therefore Halloween as well as Christmas. The Sarwin connection to the wild hunt can be seen in the understanding of what the festival represents. In some Celtic traditions, particularly the Gaulish Samonios, a cognate of Sarwin, it was effectively New Year's Day as the dark preceded the light. The event was seen not just as a day of the dead, but one in which the dead might be seen to rise or contact the living. William Shakespeare's 1597 play The Merry Wives of Windsor tells of the hunt as led by Hearn in Act 4, Scene 4. It read, There is an old tale goes that Hearn the hunter, sometime a keeper here in Windsor Forest, doth all the winter time at still midnight walk about an old oak with great ragged horns, and there he blasts the tree and takes the cattle, and makes milk kine yield blood and shakes a chain in a most hideous and dreadful manner. You have heard of such a spirit, and well you know, the superstitious idle-headed eld received and did deliver to our age this tale of Hearn the Hunter for a truth. Shakespeare based his account on earlier folklore, but it is not known how faithfully he stuck to the original legend. In 1792, author Samuel Ireland added more flesh to the bones of the legend. He posited that Hearn was the ghost of a disgraced former keeper in the forest called Richard Horn, who hanged himself on a tree. This links with the story of Odin and the world tree Yggdrasil, as we shall see later. And it is worth noting that the earliest edition of The Merry Wives of Windsor does render the name as Horn rather than Hearn. Other scholars have highlighted the similar sound of the word Hearn and the first four letters of the god Kernanos and claim it is a corruption of the word. The Old English word Hearn meaning horn and the Proto-Indo-European Kern root meaning horn or bone is cited as further evidence for this hypothesis. There is also a potential astronomical origin of the legend, with the association with the constellation of Orion. Hearn could also be so ancient as to be a continuation of a Paleolithic deity. The Green Man can be seen today in a number of churches as a pagan oddity in contrast with Christian surroundings. The character appears as a male face with leaves sprouting from it, or vines erupting from the mouth. There is a fine example tucked away in St Albans Cathedral in Hertfordshire, but where does this strange manifestation come from? There are a number of potential historical sources for the Green Man motif. Among these are the ancient Egyptian god of fertility, the dead and resurrection, Osiris, who was often portrayed as being green. He also wielded the shepherd crook and flail, or Haka and Nikaka, powerful symbols of pharaohship that bring together the mastery of animals and the harvesting of crops. Some consider the fact that the green man is usually represented as a disembodied head to be an allusion to the Norse mythological character Mimir, who was beheaded by his Vanir captors following the War of the Norse Gods. Mimir was said to guard a sacred spring of knowledge and wisdom beneath the roots of the world tree Yggdrasil. Odin was permitted to use the spring after the sacrifice of one of his eyes. Following the beheading of Mimir, Odin treated the head with preservative herbs and carved runes into it so he could revive Mimir's spirit to communicate with and receive wise counsel from him. Ultimately, the green man could be seen as what it is, an anthropomorphic representation of nature itself, anchoring man as a thing of nature rather than something separate from it. Robin Hood and his legendary wife Maid Marian began as separate folkloric entities and were strongly associated with May Day customs. May Day itself has pagan origins and centres around abundance and vegetation as the start of the summer, with the Beltane festival seen as a fire blessing of cattle and other livestock. This in turn had similarities to the Roman festival of Floralia, a celebration of the goddess of flowers, and Mayuma, which hailed Dionysus and Aphrodite. This highlights that these ceremonies and rituals, such as the Queen of the May and dancing around the clearly phallic maypole, have echoes of fertility rites that are truly ancient and inextricably wedded to nature. There are many tellings, retellings and embellishments of the Robin legends, but his woodland dwelling after a fall from grace of some kind mirrors the tale of Merlin and his retreat to the forest. Hereward the Wake was an Anglo-Saxon nobleman born in Bourne, Lincolnshire, in around 1035. He was an early and effective thorn in the side of the invading Normans after the decisive Battle of Hastings in 1066. Using the Isle of Ely as his base, Hereward roamed the East Anglian wetlands known as the Fens, attacking those loyal to William the Conqueror. Hereward took up arms after the Normans were said to have executed his brother and impaled his head on a spike at the gates of his house. 
Harrywood was said to have pursued the killers and, with the help of a companion, slaughtered 15 of them. Harrywood later allied with the Danish king Swain in the sacking of Peterborough Abbey. He also joined with Morcar, the former Saxon Earl of Northumbria, in the ultimately forlorn hope of pushing the Normans out of England. Harrowood and Morcar were pressed by the Normans and forced to flee to Ely to make what might have been a last stand. Harrowood passed into legend at this encounter, as he was said to have set a wooden tower alight which contained a Norman-hired witch who was hurling curses at the Saxon rebels. Ultimately, the Normans closed in on the island of Ely and Harrowood's ally Morcar, but Harrowood escaped into the fens and was never officially seen again. There are many legends and embellishments of Harrowood's tale, and some historians believe these help form the later legend of Robin Hood. Harrowood was said to have been the offspring of Leofric, Earl of Mercia, and the legendary Lady Godiva, a storied parentage that added another layer of mythological gloss to the figure of Harrowood. Speculation over his fate continues to this day, with some claiming that he was killed by a retinue of Norman knights. Others said he went into exile, possibly in Scotland, but the most romantic explanation is that he lived on as an outlaw in the Fens. The Norse god Odin was associated closely with bestial frenzy and, according to mythology, sacrificed himself to himself by hanging on the world tree Yggdrasil. This ties him to nature and the woods. He was also known as a wanderer and sorcerer associated with healing, who was present in other pantheons with slightly different names, such as the Anglo-Saxon Woden and Germanic Wotan. These names are theorised to stem from the Proto-Indo-European root Wodnaz, meaning Lord of Frenzy, an allusion to an untamed state of nature. The Anglo-Saxon epic poem Beowulf, from AD 700 to 1000, features the antagonist Grendel, who is described as a creature of darkness, exiled from happiness and accursed of God, the destroyer and devourer of our humankind. The exile from happiness could be read as the casting out of the creature from civilization to a more vulgar and animalistic state. The Green Knight appears in the anonymously authored story Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which was written in the 14th century. The story poses a number of chivalric tests that Sir Gawain must face in order to test his mettle. The text's background expands on the mythology that refugees descended from Aeneas following the siege of Troy went on to found European nations. The story proper begins at Christmas in the hall of King Arthur, when a mysterious green figure atop a similarly hued horse bursts in on the feast and issues a bizarre challenge to the gathered knights. The verdant interloper initiates a game whereby he instructs one of the gathered retinue to inflict an axe blow on him, if he will take a corresponding strike in a year and a day. Gawain rises and beheads him, then the Green Knight stands up, retrieves his own head and reminds Gawain of his vow to receive the same treatment a year and a day hence. The poem presents a morality tale as Gawain struggles to keep the bargain and is challenged by various dilemmas that test his chivalric virtues. The use of the colour green is a clear association with the previously mentioned Celtic green or vegetal man. It is also important to note that images of the devil, now largely portrayed in horror and fiction as being red, were sometimes depicted as having green skin in medieval art and literature. The colour green was also associated with the diabolical by Geoffrey Chaucer, a contemporary of the Gawain poet. In early English folklore, unlike in today's world of eco-activism, green was associated with toxicity, death and decay. It represented the antithesis of civilization, the untamed, the dangerous and the wild. The perception of nature has ebbed and flowed, certainly in the West, from something treated with almost or actual religious reverence to a brutal competitive realm of fear. The idea of nature as something base and bestial that the well-to-do might avert their gaze from remained the case until fairly recently. Alfred Lord Tennyson's In Memoriam, 1837-38, reveals this notion of merciless wanton savagery in the line Nature, red in tooth and claw. This was conquered by the Victorians' proliferation of managed parks and appetite for country estates. Before the Victorian era, the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, in his 1651 work Leviathan, wrote of a nightmarish situation he called the state of nature. He described this as the state of men without civil society, which state we may properly call the state of nature, is nothing else but a mere war of all against all. This raises the ever pertinent dichotomy of freedom versus security. US founding father Benjamin Franklin appeared to take a different view, stating... 
They who can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Although this digresses from the wild man of the woods somewhat, so let us return to this directly in its woodwoes form. Aldbury, a village close to the ancient Iron Age hill fort of Ivinghoe Beacon, has a very strange effigy in its local church, but first it is perhaps useful to understand the significance of Ivinghoe Beacon and its particular geographical area. The beacon lies at the northeastern tip of the ancient Ridgeway route, which passes westward and eventually encompasses hugely significant Neolithic structures like Stonehenge, Wayland Smithy, the Uffington Whitehorse and the Avebury Stone Circle. Inside the Church of St John the Baptist in Aldbury is the Pendley Chapel, which houses a recumbent effigy of Sir Robert Whittingham, who died in 1471. At Whittingham's feet is an effigy of a reclining wild man with curly hair and what those versed in heraldry would call a ragged staff. The 1400s saw a fascination with the wild man myth as a heraldic motif on coats of arms, especially in Italy and Germany, with engravers such as Martin Schonegauer and Albrecht Dürer creating images of wild men as well as their families. These legends may have been strengthened by classical European encounters with apes as they expanded into Africa and east as far as the Indian subcontinent, especially in the conquests of Alexander the Great. The Roman author Pliny the Elder once described a race of sylvestres or forest dwellers in India who had humanoid bodies but were covered in fur and unable to speak. This mysterious race were almost certainly gibbons. However, as we have seen, the northern European consciousness has notions of wild men at least contemporaneously and the older epic of Gilgamesh also included such an entity. In modern times, the wild man of the woods has perhaps morphed into something else, the abominable snowman, yeti, bigfoot, sasquatch, mink or other such alleged missing link animals. These cryptids, perhaps including other odd modern legends like that of the mothman, beast of Bodmin Moor or old stinker, are, according to tales of alleged sightings, present in almost every continent. Often the wild man is portrayed as hairy, like sightings of Bigfoot or the Yeti, but is this a literal or an allegorical representation? Does the hairiness denote the actual folkloric appearance of the wild man of old, or is it representative of wildness itself? Ultimately, there seems to be an innate folk memory of the other, something outside of the control of civilised society. Is this a vindication of Carl Jung's shadow archetype? Do they represent man's deep and buried fears of what he might become, the unacknowledged dark side of human nature? Or are they a representation or subconscious attempt to differentiate human beings from the realm of nature? Whatever they are, they are going nowhere. Vicious criminals are routinely described as monsters in tabloid newspapers. Perhaps the real wild man exists in all of us and it is up to us to keep him in check. Or, perhaps a return to a more natural balance with nature would be beneficial as advanced so-called civilization has shown itself capable of unspeakable atrocities. These are questions which we are able to ask literally by virtue of the fact that we are inherently separate from the animals and forests, even though we came from them. That's it for this video. Don't forget to like, share and most importantly subscribe. Thank you for watching.